Thank you, Clive. Um, I thought as soon as I finished praying, well, I forgot about Julie. So <laughs> thank you that, uh, for remembering that. Julie is having a heart operation on Tuesday, so remember her in your prayers. We're uh, turning today to Luke chapter 15. chapter 15. And the Lord has great love and concern for those that are lost. And he rejoices greatly when they are restored. This passage tells us how he earnestly seeks for them and, and welcomes with open arms those who will respond to the call of the gospel and turn from going their own way and come to Jesus Christ. The final words of Luke 14 that we looked at last week were, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. In the very next words in chapter 15 say, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. Keep reading verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he, lays, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Again, chapter 14 ends with that statement, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Chapter 15 tells us that one of the groups of people that, that did hear, that did come and, and drew near to him, in order to listen to what he had to say, were tax collectors. Now, tax collectors were particularly looked down on in Jewish society. And that's not just because people don't like paying taxes, though that probably had something to do with it. But they were looked on as, as traitors, because ultimately they were working for the Roman government that had conquered and subjugated and were oppressing the Jewish people. Not only that, but they had a reputation of being dishonest, of charging more than they ought and enriching themselves by that. Uh, earlier in Luke, when John the Baptist was preaching and the tax collectors came to him and said, what should we do? His instruction to them was to charge nothing more than what was appointed. We'll see later on in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 19, the conversion of someone who was such a cheat, dishonest man. The scripture often links together this group, the tax collectors, which refers to their occupation, with a more general category of people, sinners. Sometimes it's 
link together with more specific groups. For example, Matthew 18, verse 17, they're linked together with, with the heathen or the pagan. Or in Matthew 21, the tax collectors and harlots or prostitutes are mentioned together. But more often than not, it's the general term of sinners, those who were openly sinful in their lifestyle. For example, we saw this in Luke chapter 5, verse 30, and Luke 7, 34, and I'll refer to those two passages in just a moment. In both of those, Jesus is criticized, as he is here, for his association and seeming acceptance of these people. In chapter 5 and verse number 30, uh, after Jesus called Levi, the tax collector, to follow him, and, and Levi left everything in order to follow Jesus, and Levi, in, in, to show how he was responding to this, hosted a great feast for Jesus and invited all of his tax collector friends. And people objected to Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Again, in chapter 7, verse 34, Jesus is accused of being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. As he is in this passage, he's receiving them and he's welcoming them and even eating with them. The two groups that were making this complaint, again, one is an occupation, and the other is a, a group, a, I might say a, a religious sect or faction, but perhaps it would be better to understand just a religious group, a group of people that thought alike. Uh, the one that is the occupation is the scribes. Uh, the word itself uh, refers to a writing function, and they would have been involved with keeping written records. But in Jewish society, they also would have been copyists of God's law and the scriptures. And because they were spending a lot of time copying and recopying the scriptures, they became experts and knowledgeable about the scriptures. Hence, if you're looking at the NIV, they interpret this as teachers of the law. And they certainly would have been teachers of the law. They would have been people who would have been well-versed in the scriptures. The Pharisees, the, the religious group, were characterized by being very religious. They were conservatives. They took the observance of the details of the law very seriously. In fact, they were scrupulous law keepers, and they were proud of it. But these two groups were objecting and complaining that Jesus was not separated enough. He's not avoiding these other two groups whose lives were contaminated by sin. He's associating himself with those who were openly disobedient to the law and those who were practicing evil and wickedness. And yet here is Jesus. He's receiving them. He's welcoming them. He's accepting them into his presence, even eating with them. Now, even today, but especially in that day, to eat together was, was a sign of fellowship. To, to sit down at a meal together uh, spoke of communion, uh, of sharing and, and holding things in common. And they looked at the fact that Jesus is accepting and eating with these people as the fact that he is accepting and even affirming their lifestyle and the sinfulness that it represented. And in response to their complaint, Jesus told this parable to them. Now we might look at the rest of chapter 15 as three parables, three different illustrations. I've only read two of them, but in reality, all three should be viewed as one. They have one main point. But with as much as I had to say about the first two, I figured we'd play the next one, or the last one, until another time. But 
Oftentimes, people will refer to them as three parables, but in reality, there's, there's just one. Luke uses the singular, Jesus told this parable to. The three have one main point. There might be different aspects and different emphases in the various stories. A, a number of interpreters see the first one as the work of Christ and the second, that of the Holy Spirit, and the third, the attitude of the Father. I think that there's some merit in that perspective, but the main point that is found in all three is God's love for the lost. That these who were being looked down on and despised by others for their failure to do the right thing, God cares about them. <laughs> And God seeks after them. He sees them as lost. And when they are found, there is great joy and rejoicing. Now note that what Jesus says here, he doesn't see this as something that is extraordinary or unusual. But as something that is the normal behavior for something that is valued. Notice his words, verse 3, he asked, what man of you? Or in verse number 9, what woman? In other words, he expects that this is the normal response, that this is what is usual and expected. In other words, he's saying this is what you would do. This is what happens when something that is valued is lost. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one, what would you do? Now, one out of a hundred, you might say, well, that's not a very big percentage. That's, that's one percent. But the response is not, well, I still have 99 more and, and 99 is, is a pretty good flock. Um, you know, one missing is not too great of a loss. Just accept it and move on. No, he says you wouldn't do that. You would leave the 99 in the wilderness, in the open country, to go and look for it. Now it's obvious here that he's going to make provision for the safekeeping of the 90 and 9. He just doesn't leave them unrestrained, uncontrolled, because if he went away, when he comes back, some of them would be missing as well. So that's, that's obviously part of the thinking here. Left to themselves, they too would be missing. The, the scripture speaks about sheep without a shepherd and their tendency to wander and be scattered. But the point that he's making is he leaves the 90 and 9 to search for the one. Because he cares about that one. He is concerned for its well-being. It's not merely about his balance sheet and his net worth. But he cares about that individual sheep. Jesus in John chapter 10 uh, talks about the shepherd calling his sheep by name. And he says the good shepherd knows his sheep and is known by them. Uh, it speaks of a relationship that is close and intimate. A, a care and a concern that he has for each and every one of them that goes beyond simply their economic value. And that's why the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now there is a sense in which the shepherd's whole life is a laying down of his life for the sheep. Because his whole life is given over to caring for them and providing for them, to leading them to pasture and to protecting them from threats against them. But I suppose in an even greater sense, we see him laying down his life when he leaves the rest to hunt for the one. 
The shepherd is laying down his life when he goes searching and seeking to rescue the one that is lost. You see the effort that he expends in searching for you, retracing his steps, calling as he goes. Uh, some of the songwriters or poets use a little bit of poetic license here, I think in, particularly of Elizabeth uh, Clefane's poem that was set to music by Ira Sankey, uh, the 90 and 9, that speaks about the mountains wild and bare and how deep were the waters that he crossed looking for this. The poet speaks of his hands being rent and torn and pierced by many a thorn. And, and clearly the, the imagery here is to remind us of what Jesus, our good shepherd, went through for us. But it's, it's certainly suggestive of the cost of what it might take to find a lost sheep. At the very least, there's going to be some time that is taken and some distance that is covered when the shepherd could be at home relaxing with his feet up and just resting but he searches until he finds it the scripture here speaks of, of persistence he keeps on looking until it is located and rescued he won't give up he won't quit until it is found And then what does he do? It says that he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. You see here his tender care. He's not full of anger and frustration about this stupid sheep that made me go looking. He doesn't drag it back. He doesn't drive it back. But you see the gentleness and the kindness as he lays it on his shoulders and carries it home. And he does that, it says, with rejoicing. He, he is full of joy because the lost has been found. And then when he arrives back at home, there's further rejoicing as he calls together the friends and the neighbors and he says, rejoice with me, I've found my sheep that was lost. A sense of excitement, a sense of gladness that Jesus expects would be the natural response of everyone in his audience if they had lost something like that. And then Jesus says, likewise, and here is the spiritual reality. He says, likewise, there is joy in heaven over a sinner who repents. God the Father and the angelic hosts Again, to use the words of a song, ring the bells of heaven. There is joy today, for a sinner has returned. There's a celebration when a sinner realizes his lostness and turns in repentance and comes back to a right relationship with God. Let's be very clear. Jesus isn't saying that the sinner is okay just as he is. That God accepts him and that it doesn't really matter how he is living. No, that's what it means to be lost. To be living however they happen to be living. But there is joy when a sinner realizes that he is a sinner. When he acknowledges that the way that he's been living is not pleasing to God that it is sin and he's willing and ready to come back. And when he returns, what matters isn't how far he had gone or what he had done. What matters is that he's been found, that he's home once again. In fact, Jesus says there is more joy over that one sinner that is repentant than over 99 who don't need repentance. And I suppose the reference there is to 
the Pharisees and the scribes, who saw themselves as upright, who saw themselves as better than those other people. In pride, they looked down on the tax collectors and the sinners. But Jesus says God's heart, God's attitude, is that he rejoices more over the one sinner that comes home than over the 99 who stayed where they should have. Now I'm quite sure that Jesus isn't saying, so go out and sin big so that you have something to repent of. I'm sure that that's not the message Jesus is communicating. And in reality, the scripture makes it very plain that in an absolute sense, there is no one who needs no repentance. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wise man in the Old Testament said, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and doesn't sin. Or consider the words of the prophet Isaiah, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And by the way, that's what sin is. Sin is when we go our own way, when we choose our own path instead of following the shepherd. What a sheep is supposed to do is stay with the shepherd. But too often we go off our own way. And that's what Isaiah says, we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that, of course, is the ultimate sense in which our good shepherd lay down his life for his sheep. Jesus goes to the cross. He suffers the rejection of men. He was beaten and spit upon and nailed to a cross. And all of that is taking the consequences and the judgment that our waywardness, our straying, our wandering away cost. He took our guilt so that we might receive mercy and grace despite the wrong that we've done. That we might be tenderly laid on the shepherd's shoulders and be carried home. The second illustration is about a woman. And again, the question is, is asked. It's a rhetorical question. Or what woman with ten silver coins? Uh, the Greek word here is a drachma, uh, which I understand to be a Greek coin that is similar to the Roman denarius. Uh, the translation that I'm reading from, the New King James, has a footnote that suggests that this may be part of a ten-piece garland worn by married women. Understood that way, um, this piece of jewelry is spoiled by a missing piece. And some suggest also that it would have sentimental value like a, an engagement ring or a wedding band might have to us. Others think that these were just ordinary coins. Uh, and just look at it in terms of monetary value. So what is the value of a drachma? Well, one of these silver coins. Now to us, coins have very little value. There's not much you can do with coins. But in this circumstance, what is the value? How poor is the woman? It's part of the question. What could you afford to buy with it? And from what I've studied, it seems like this coin, much like the denarius, was about a day's wage. So to put that into our context, what's a day's wage? How much can you earn in a day? Minimum wage is 1984. So let's just round that off to make the, the math simple to $20. $20 an hour? times an eight-hour day, although they might well have worked a 10-hour day or a 12-hour day, but just for our sake, 
Eight hour day times $20, $160. It's a fair amount of money. Not only that, but it was one-tenth of her available cash. First story, it was one percent. One out of a hundred. Here we've got one out of ten. I had an incident a few weeks ago where I misplaced a zippered pouch with about $120 in it. And while $120 is less than a tenth of the available cash that I have, I assure you that I searched diligently to find it. <laughs> because I know what $120 will buy. Unlike the woman in the story, I didn't light a lamp and sweep the house. I knew that it wasn't in the house. I knew that I had lost it somewhere at Tuggera Shopping Center, well, between Tuggera Shopping Center and coming home. I started, first of all, look through the bags of groceries if maybe I slipped it in with one of those and not finding it there, then I went to the car and then I started making phone calls to various shops. And in the end, I, I ended up driving back later on to, to Tuggera and retracing steps. Thankfully, it was found and with all of the money still inside. And I assure you that I rejoiced the way this woman rejoiced. Again, we see significant effort expended on her part. Again, in the picture of this in the first century, she, she lights a lamp. It's not a matter of flicking on a switch. And they wouldn't have had many windows in the house, so it would have been fairly dark. She would have lit a lamp and, and looked in all of the corners and all of the crevices, trying to, to see just a glimmer of the, the shine of this coin. There's a reminder here to us that those who are lost are in the darkness. Yeah. And that light is required in order for them to be found. Holy Spirit illuminates the heart of the sinner. He shines the light of the glorious gospel of Christ in order that they might come. She takes her broom and she carefully sweeps, looking there in the dust and in the dirt. And that reminds me that if it's found, it's probably going to be dirty. But the reality is it has intrinsic value. It's not about whether it's dirty or not dirty. It's something that has value in and of itself. It can be cleaned and polished. And so does every person who is made in the image and likeness of God. We have, every person, an intrinsic value. We matter to Him. And again, as in the first illustration, she searches until she finds it. There's a, a persistence. She's sure that it had to be there somewhere, and so she painstakingly moves every piece of furniture and leaves no corner unswept. And again, there is the excitement and the celebration as she calls together friends and neighbors, rejoice with me. I have found the peace that I have lost. And again, Jesus says, likewise, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. Not just that the angels are rejoicing, but that God himself rejoices over the sinner who comes back that sinner is just as lost as the silver piece that was missing. There are some differences in this second example. The coin has no will. It did nothing. It just fell or was dropped and rolled behind something. There was no choice that it made. I suppose unlike in the first story, the sheep was at the very least foolish and inattentive. 
Really, it's not until we get to the third story that we won't get to today that we see the full picture of the willful decision to go away. And then of a willful decision, I will return and repent and acknowledge the wrong that I have done. In the case of the lost sheep and the lost coin, the owner doesn't know where it is. But with the lost individual, God fully knows where the sinner is. He sees and he knows. He's seeking, not in the sense of trying to find where it is, but calling to return. He calls sinners to repentance. The coin can't respond. But the sinner must recognize his lost condition. He must be aware that he is away from where he ought to be. And come to a change of mind and a change of heart and turns around, turns away from himself and his ways and his desires and his pleasures. And turns back to the one to whom he belongs, the one who is his maker and the redeemer. Christ was sent to seek and to save those who are lost. And the Holy Spirit shines the light of the gospel of Christ and he cleanses and he restores. And there is joy in heaven when the lost come back and when they're brought back to the place where they ought to be. Have you experienced that joy of being back in the place where you ought to be? We're going to close with a song that speaks of the fact that the Lord Jesus receives sinners. He welcomes them. He doesn't welcome them to stay on sinners, but he, he welcomes them to come back to Him, to repent turn to Him and receive salvation. Christ receives sinful men.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you receive sinners. Because if you didn't receive sinners, there would be no hope for any of us. But we thank you that you have called us to yourself, that you have, have sought and brought us home. Lord, help us to live in, in rejoicing of what you have done for us. And help us to share that message with others who need to be found by him. That they too might turn from their wicked ways and come back to the shepherd of the sheep. Dismiss us now with your blessing. May your grace go with us and keep us. And help us to live for him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.